Hello everyone and welcome to our Wednesday evening devotional. This is Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carruthersville, Missouri. Back from vacation. Looking forward to Bible class tonight. I'm glad to extend to you this Wednesday evening devotional. Now this is the second part of a lesson I gave two weeks ago on things to take to your wedding. There's an old saying or superstition that we hear at a lot of weddings concerning what the bride should be sure to take to her wedding. How does it go? Something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. There are also some very important things, spiritually speaking, that neither the bride nor the groom will want to forget or neglect. While most of you are a number of years away from getting married, it is crucial, even in your younger years, to consider what you will bring to the marriage altar. Your attitudes and actions now will determine what you will bring then. Take purity of person to your wedding. Every person who comes to the marriage altar should bring with him or her purity of person. The Hebrew youth Joseph refused to commit fornication in Genesis 39 with Potiphar's wife. He successfully resists her, her passionate propositions by saying, Behold, my master walleth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis 39, 8 through 9. The morality that he practiced in Genesis 39 permitted his bringing purity of person to his later marriage with Asenath in Genesis 41. If Joseph could resist such vigorous temptations as these, then our young people surely can too. The Bible is full of admonitions for moral cleanliness and sexual purity. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God, Matthew 5, 8. Paul urged young Timothy, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4, 12. He admonished him to treat the younger women as sisters with all purity, 1 Timothy 5 and 2, and to keep himself pure, 1 Timothy 5, 22. Paul encouraged Timothy to flee youthful lust and to be among those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, 2 Timothy 2, 22. John encourages us to purify ourselves even as the Lord is pure, 1 John 3, 3. Those who resolve to walk in the Lord's way will not regret it. You will want to take personal purity with you to the marriage altar. Next, take permanency of purpose to your wedding. Jesus declared in Matthew 19:5, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let not man put asunder. The word cleave literally means to be glued to. In matrimony, there is to be a gluing and a cleaving to one spouse. Absolutely too many marriages in our time are becoming unglued. Instead of there being a cleaving to each other, there is a leaving of each other. 
Well, Jesus surely did not intend for husbands to put aside the tie that binds. And neither did he intend for wives to do it. Neither did he intend for interfering in-laws to attempt to do it. And he surely did not intend for some home record to come along and to seal, steal the affections of one of the spouses either. Breaking up another's home is a sin that defies adequate description. In fact, the only exception which Jesus granted for divorce is in allowing the innocent party to put away a mate who has fornicated. Matthew 19 and verse 9. The innocent party may then enter into another marriage, provided the person who is married also has the right to marry. But that's the exception to the rule. And the rule is one man for one woman for life. In Romans 7, 2 and 3, For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. 1 Corinthians 7.39 says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. In both of these passages, Paul teaches, that the woman married to a man is bound by the law to him as long as he lives. Paul taught that marriage is for life. And regardless of how the world treats the binding nature of marriage, the Bible teaches that matrimony is an institution for the lives of the two who enter it. You'll want to take permanency of purpose to your wedding. Next, take loyalty of love to your wedding. And that's absolutely crucial because it takes a lot of loving to make a marriage work. No couple should ever contemplate marriage except upon the beautiful basis of deep love and affection for each other. The Holy Spirit speaks of the characteristics of agape love in 1 Corinthians 13. There he says, love suffers long. It is patient and enduring. Love is kind. Love envieth not. Husbands and wives must be trustful and trustworthy. Notice this little proverb. People of genius are admired. People of wealth are envied. People of power are feared. But only people of character are trusted. If you can't trust him or her out of your sight, there's something wrong, isn't there? Love vaunteth not itself. It's not boastful, is not puffed up. Love is not arrogant. Love does not behave itself unseemly. It does not act unbecomingly. Love seeketh not her own. It does not seek its own way. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. It does not keep account of wrong suffering. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rather in the truth. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails. Others may walk away, abandon us, but the loving and faithful spouse is always there. There's enough right there to fill a whole book, isn't there? You will want to bring a heart full of that kind of love to your marriage. Christian love is agape love. It is sacrificial. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Agape love is a stabilizing force in the marriage as God wants the marriage to be. It is not love because of, rather it is love in spite of. 
It says no matter who or what you are, no matter the circumstances of life, I will love you with that love that will always seek the best for you. In the ideal marriage, there will be eros or sexual love, storge or family love, phileo or friendship love, and agape all present. That's a full marriage. You know, friends, this is just one reason why you need to marry a Christian. And why it's unwise to marry a non-Christian. It doesn't mean that problems will never arise. But it means that when they do, real Christians practicing agape love will work together. Because their priority is God first and others second. Yes. Agape is a love that never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It's the most vital and essential ingredient in a successful marriage. Not that two people cannot live together all their lives without it, but marriage can never be what it was meant to be, that measure of joy and blessing that God intended marriage to provide for man, unless agape love is present. These are just some of the things that you'll want to take to your wedding, and they are of far more value than all the flowers and all the trimmings that you could ever plan or hope to have at your wedding. You'll want to take God to your wedding. You'll want to take purity of person, permanency of purpose, and the loyalty of love. And there's nothing that will enhance the beauty of your marriage as much as being a faithful Christian for Christ. Thanks so much for listening today to our Wednesday evening devotional. Tune in next time. Well, then, this is Mike McDaniel with the Central Church of Christ in Providence, Missouri. Have a good day.